Hope you had a blessed week this week. And of course, it's always good to be with you all, worshiping our Lord and Savior, uh, Jesus Christ, together. So we continue in the season of Advent as we prepare our hearts for Christmas. And we are exploring the famous Christmas songs. And no, it is not the secular songs that we normally hear in the stores about Rudolph's Red Nose or about snow or about Santa's sleigh. No, it is about the proper Christmas songs that is based upon Scripture. For our aim is to look at these famous Christmas carols and tie these lines to the verses of the Bible. And we want to examine these lines very closely so that we can apply these truths to our daily lives. It is a chance for us to focus our thoughts on the gift that God has given us in His Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who stepped down from heaven, who took on flesh, so that we might believe and be saved. So this week we'll be looking at the Christmas carol, Angels We Have Heard on High. For this famous hymn commemorates the birth of Jesus Christ, which is found in the Gospel of Luke. Now if you recall, this is the same passage that I preached last year, and remember it was titled, Steadfast Joy in Christ Our Saviour. And although I view some of the aspects from this message of last year, the focus this year will be on the song, on the Christmas carol, Angels We Have Heard on High. Now the song focuses on the shepherd's encounter with the angels that foretell the birth of Jesus Christ. It reveals the joy that the shepherds had in their hearts when they found baby Jesus in the manger. For the opening verse of the song goes like this. It says, Angels we have heard on high, sweetly singing over the plains, and the mountains in reply, echoing their joyous strains. And of course the chorus, Gloria in excelsis Deo, Gloria in excelsis Deo, which means glory to God in the highest in Latin. So let's examine the scriptures together this afternoon and see where these amazing lines stem from this hymn. So if you can please stand with me as we read from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 2, beginning at the first verse. So Luke, chapter 2, from verses 1 to 15. The birth of Jesus Christ. In those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration when Quirinius was governor of Syria, and all went to be registered, each to his own town. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the town of Nazareth to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed, who was with child. And while they were there, the time came for her to give birth, and she gave birth to a firstborn son, and wrapped him in swaddling cloths, and laid him in a manger, because there was no place for them in the inn. Now, verses 8. And in the same region there were shepherds out in the field keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them. And they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Saviour who is Christ the Lord, and this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. And when the angels went away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let us go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. Let's pray. 
Father God, we want to thank you for this blessed day that you have given us, Lord. We pray that we may rejoice and be glad in it. Father God, we pray that as we study the scriptures, Lord, that your spirit helps us to see the joy in the shepherd's hearts, Lord. For when the angels told them about the wonderful news of the birth of your son, Jesus, Lord, they made urgency, Lord. They went there with haste to see this wonderful sight, Father God. So, Lord, as we see the truths of these scriptures, Father, as pastor pray that we apply it to our lives today, Lord. And may the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. You may be seated. So in the text today, we observe that it was written by Luke. Now Luke was a Gentile, and he was a native of Antioch. He was accompanied by Paul, or he accompanied Paul on many missionary journeys. And Paul referred to him as the great physician. And we know that from his writings, it was very detailed. It was very methodical, so that the excellent Theophilus would know with certainty of the things that were being taught. But Luke sets up the narrative now by foretelling the birth of John the Baptist and the baby Jesus. Because if we have a look in Luke chapter 1, he details the visit by angel Gabriel to the Virgin Mary. So if we read in Luke chapter 1, verses 28 to 32, the angel says to Mary, Greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at the saying, and try to discern what sort of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb, your womb a bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and be called the Son of the Most High. Now, of course, we know that Mary accepted this because she said, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be me according to your word. And shortly after this, as we know, Luke records Mary's song of faith, which we refer to as Mary's Magnificat, a song that reveals Mary's heart at the time and her mind, for it was clearly saturated with the word of God. And it is a song of absolute pure joy. So in our text today, let's look at my first point, the setting which is found in verses 1 to 7. So Luke writes, In those days a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. Now the New King James Version says it like this. It says, And it came to pass in those days. So this tells us that Luke records actual historical events, real events, this is not some fictional story based on some fictional characters or some fictional events. It is not a once upon a time story or a fable. No, this is real events. It is fact, not fiction. And the story of Jesus occurs during a time of one of the most interesting men in ancient history. For Caesar Augustus, he was born and his name was Octavian named after his father. Now his grandmother was the sister of Julius Caesar, and being a talented young man, Octavian came to the attention of his great uncle, who was Julius Caesar, and he eventually adopted Octavian as his son, and he was made an official heir in approximately 45 BC. And within a year that Julius Caesar was murdered, Octavian joined two other people, namely Mark Antony and Lepidus, in splitting the dominion of Rome in three ways. And then for decades following that, the whole of the Mediterranean world was filled with much wars and violence, for there were years of bloody, brutal fighting for the power and for money in Rome. However, Octavia then defeated all his enemies, and that included Mark Antony and Lepidus, and he became the sole ruler of Rome, and he took the title Caesar Augustus. Now, it is interesting that for many years before, 100 years previously, Rome was considered a republic, 
a nation that was governed by laws but not by a man. But now, of course, Octavius would change all of that, right? For in 27 BC, he arranged that the Roman Senate would give him the title Augustus, which means exalted or sacred one. Now, Rome wasn't then a republic anymore governed by laws. Instead, it was an empire governed by an emperor. He demanded absolute power over the Roman Empire. And Luke continues in his narrative. He says, This was the first registration when Quirinius was governor of Syria, and all went to be registered, each to his own town. Now, the registration described here was it was not for simple record-keeping or for census to keep uh, statistics of people. No, it was effectively to tax everybody in Rome. And the fact that Luke mentions Quirinius and that he was governing Syria adds to the authenticity of the facts that he writes about, right? He uses verifiable people and historical events. And it is interesting to think that one man sitting in the palaces of Rome, gave a command, and that the whole world responded. But we know, as the narrative proceeds, that he was not the only king that is mentioned here in the story. For Jesus appears later in the narrative, and we know Jesus is the king above all kings, whose kingdom will reign forever, for eternity, and will not disappear or falter like Caesar Augustus. And Caesar, he sat in his palace and he made this decree. He thought that he was supreme in exercising his will. But essentially, he was just a tool in God's hand. For according to the prophet Micah, God had promised that the Messiah would be born in Bethlehem, which you see in Micah chapter 5, verse 2. And that promise would be fulfilled for our triune God in eternity past, decreed that Jesus Christ would be sent as the Savior of the world. Now that, for me, is absolute power. And one commentator puts it like this. So how does one get a young couple from Nazareth down to Bethlehem when they might not be inclined to travel? Well, simple. Just wo work through the political Savior of the world and use him as a pawn in your plan. God allowed Caesar Augustus to rise to power for many reasons. In some ways, he was like a Roman John the Baptist, preparing for Jesus' coming. Who does the world know more today, Jesus or Caesar Augustus? Who has a more lasting legacy, Jesus or Caesar? And the, the text continues, and Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the town of Nazareth to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and the lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed, who was with child. And while they were there, the time came for her to give birth. And she gave birth to a firstborn son, and wrapped him in swaddling cloths, and laid him in a manger, because there was no place for them in the inn. So we see Mary and Joseph, they undertook this difficult and arduous and challenging journey from Nazareth to Bethlehem, which was just outside Jerusalem. It was approximately 80 miles in distance, so not a short distance in those days. It was a significant undertaking which cost a lot of time and a lot of money. But he uh, took his betrothed wife Mary, accompanied him on his journey. And according to the Roman law, Mary didn't have to go with him for tax censuses. But Joseph wanted her close by his side. Now perhaps it was because she was in the latter stages of her controversial pregnancy, which was most likely the uh, subject of much gossip in Nazareth. Or perhaps, as the text tells us, she was his betrothed, which means that it was more binding than an engagement and was virtually a form of marriage. And thus, she was to become his wife and was about to give birth. So Joseph didn't want to leave her side. And she was about to give birth to her firstborn. 
Uh, we know that that indicates that Jesus was not her only child, but according to Jewish custom, he was also the preeminent heir. And she wrapped him in swaddling cloths. Now the Greek term that is used here means to tear, so that there were torn strips of cloth that were wrapped around baby Jesus. And the child was put in a manger or a feeding trough, which was used for domestic animals. And we know that his birth was in a public place because there was no room for him at the inn. So now we get on to my second point, the angelic announcement, which is found in uh, verses 8 to 14. And this is where the wonderful lines of the song, Angels We Have Heard on High, comes from. So take note of these words. And in the same region, there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them. And they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace among those with whom he is pleased. So it's really not difficult to see where the wonderful lines from the song, Angels We Have Heard on High, comes from. Because if we examine the verses from um, this wonderful Christmas carol, we'll find this. So verse 1 says, Angels, we have heard on high, sweetly singing o'er the plains, and the mountains in reply, echoing their joyous strains. And then the wonderful chorus, glorious in excelsis Deo, glorious in excelsis Deo. Then the second verse goes, shepherds, why this jubilee? Why your joyous strains prolong? What the gladsome tidings be, which inspire your heavenly song? And again, Gloria in excelsis Deo. Gloria in excelsis Deo. Because we see in verse 8, it says that the shepherds were out in the field keeping watch over their flock by night. And the shepherds, we know, were in Jerusalem, which was very close to Bethlehem. Now, many of the sheep that were used for the temple sacrifices came from this region. And of course, it was the shepherd's role and responsibility to protect the sheep from all the wild animals. They were to make sure that they were protected from harm and that they had plenty of food and water to drink, that they were to ensure that the sheep were well fed and that they were healthy. And we know that the surrounding hills were the ultimate grazing land and where the shepherds worked day and night, all year round. And although the shepherds was considered a major occupation during Jesus' time, we know that the profession itself was unskilled, for the shepherds were relegated to the lower economic status of society at the time. They lived mainly outdoors, and they probably reeked of the unpleasant smell from all the animals. And they had a very bad reputation, and they were considered unreliable, for they were not allowed to give testimony in the courts of laws. But nonetheless, it is interesting that the angel appears to them first to announce the birth of Jesus, right? This essentially answers the questions in the second verse that says, Shepherds, why this jubilee? Why your joyous strange prolong? What the gladsome tidings be which inspire your heavenly song? Well, it was the birth of Jesus Christ. For we witness the glory of the Lord shone around them, but they were filled with great fear. Again, we see that fear is mentioned here. Repetition of an angel appearing and a person feeling fearful. Now this fear and trouble also happened or occurred to Mary and Zechariah when the angel appeared to them. But now the shepherds appear fearful. And I'm sure they would have been really startled by the angels appearing from nowhere. 
Now this of course would have been an absolutely normal response, an appropriate one. And it is interesting that Luke takes note of this for the presence and often reports fear, sorry, in the presence of God and his work. But as we well know that fear brings with a typical negative concept or a negative connotation where we are afraid of something, something bad or something that we need to avoid. But we know that the dictionary definition of fear also shows us that it means a profound reverence and awe, especially towards God. For when we read the scriptures and we understand who God is, and we know that God isn't bad, he's not something that is negative or that we should avoid, we know that God is our good God, that he is our heavenly father, that he is our creator, that he loves us, and that he has made each and every one of us in his own image. For the Hebrew word for fear used is hira, which means awe. So it therefore means respect, it means reverence, it means worship. So notice that Luke uses the word God and Lord interchangeably many times during this passage. So we are to worship God, we are to reverence God, we are to have respect for God. For verse 9 he says, The angel of the Lord appeared, and the glory of the Lord shone. And in verse 11, Luke refers to Jesus as Christ our Lord. And in verse 13 and 14, he says, Suddenly there was the angel, a multitude of heavenly hosts, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. So witness, so what we witness here, we see that God is being praised here with great joy and with great wonder. And again, the Bible teaches us about the character of God. He's our righteous creator. He created the heavens and the earth and everything in it. He created us in his own image to worship him so that we are accountable to him. And we know that he is sovereign, that he is the author of life and the author of salvation. So he's worthy of all our praise, honor, and glory. And also, we see that in verse 10, where the angel said, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy, and it will be for all people. All people. Yes, not just a select few, but for all people. For all people. Not just for the Jews, but also for the Gentiles and for the Samaritans. For all people from all works of life. For everyone. For you, for me, for Americans, for Canadians, for South Africans, um, Africans, Indians, everybody. It is for all people. And this really should fill our hearts with great joy, right? For John Piper makes it clear that from this context and the gospel, that fearlessness and the greatness of the joy is not just for the shepherds. It is for everyone who says Jesus is Lord and is glad to have it so. For the, world, for the word signals that calling Jesus my Lord and my God is the foundation of Christian fearlessness and great joy. And so as we continue in our text, the angel says to the shepherds, For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. So we see from this portion, we see that it is clear that Jesus uh, we see Jesus is humanity, and we see Jesus' divinity in this sh short text. For Luke tells us that he was born on this day in the city of David. Now this refers to Bethlehem, a town where David was born. Not the city of David, which is found on the southern slopes of Mount Zion. For Luke writes, he is born, for meaning he took on flesh. And so his birth, we have the incarnation of God himself. And we know John writes that in John chapter 1, verses 14, where he says, The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. So Jesus was human. Jesus experienced human emotions like any of us. He became tired. He fatigued. He was hungry. He was um, angry. Uh, he experienced much grief and sorrow. Jesus experienced humanity. But also, again, notice that the angels refer to Jesus as Savior Christ the Lord, showing us his 
deity, his divine nature. For the three titles here that is used, Savior, Lord, and God, refer to the greatness of Mary's son. For Savior, the first word used, Savior. Now this is only one of only two places in the gospel where we see the word Savior. The other is in John chapter 4, verses 42, where the men of Sychar confessed him as Savior of the world. And Christ is Greek for the Hebrew word Messiah. And we see the word Lord, which can also mean Master, or, my, or most likely the covenant-keeping name of God. So that shows Christ's deity. Christ is also God. And... It is clear that Christ's work did not begin at his birth. It began in eternity past in the covenant of redemption. Now the covenant of redemption is the pact and the agreement that took place in eternity within the Godhead, within the triune God. And we see that R.C. Sproul said, the Father designed the plan of redemption and the Son was assigned the plan for, to accomplish this plan of redemption and the Holy Spirit applies this redemption to our daily lives. So Christ was the second person of the Trinity, and he takes it upon himself, the human nature, for the purposes of redemption. The plan of redemption has got absolutely nothing to do with us, nothing to do with our works. It is all upon God. God took the initiative. And this should really bring us great joy because if it was down to us, we would be in a great deal of trouble. We have a loving Father who sent His one and only Son, Jesus Christ, to redeem us, to pay the penalty for our sin. For without it, we would have no hope. We'll be walking around like dead corpses. So, if we examine a third verse in our song today, Angels we have heard on high, and it goes like this. Come to Bethlehem and see him whose birth the angels sing. Come adore on bended knee, Christ the Lord, the newborn King. Gloria in excelsis Deo. Gloria in excelsis Deo. For the angels expressed to the shepherds that there would be a sign. And what would they find? Well, they would find a baby who was wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. Now, not a great way to enter the world, was it? To be born in a stinky stable with a bunch of animals around, right? Certainly not a palace that is fit for a king. It appears really sad. It appears really pathetic. Hardly worth the Israel's long-awaited Messiah, King of the Jews. And Bob Diffenbauer makes a very interesting observation as well. He says this. He says, the two most pathetic factors in the birth of our Lord was his swaddling cloths and his cattle feeding trough bed. Not only set this child apart from all the others, but also identified him with the shepherds. For one of the names of Messiah is Emmanuel, which means God with us, as Pastor took us through this last week. And the circumstances of our Lord's birth uniquely identified the Lord Jesus with the shepherds. For we see that the Lord had no roof over his head. He had no house to dwell in. Well, neither did the shepherds. They slept in the fields at night with no roof over their heads, and they slept under the stars as they cared for their flocks. We also see that Jesus was poor and of no reputation, but they were too. They were also poor and of no reputation. And Jesus was to be born the sacrificial lamb of God, and he was the good shepherd. And he identified with these shepherds by being found in a cattle feeding trough. So were they considered unclean because of their contact with animals? Well, so was Jesus. What a beautiful picture of our Lord's humiliation and identification with men, even the most humble of men that were rejected and despised but we know that that's how god ordained it that's exactly how the prophets foretold it for suddenly the angels there was a multitude of the heavenly host praising god and saying glory to god in the highest 
and peace among those with whom he is pleased. Now this must have been an amazing sight to behold. You can picture the heavens that is filled with thousands upon thousands of angels like an army encampment. And we see one commentator declares that the world needed peace then and the world needs peace now. For even the pagans of the first century world sensed this need for peace and a savior. Epictetus, a first century pagan writer, expressed it like this. He said, while the emperor may give peace from war on land and sea, he is unable to give peace from passion, from grief, and from envy. He cannot give peace of the heart, which man yearns for more than even outward peace. So then notice my third point, the shepherd's response in verse 15. So when the angels went away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. So what do we see? We see the shepherds, they made haste. For in verse 16 it says, they hurried off. They didn't ha hesitate, they didn't hang around for a while, they didn't question each other about what they saw and what they observed. No, upon hearing the news they showed genuine sign of urgency. And again, what was the sign that they were to look for? Well, the angel told them, look for a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths, lying in a manger. So it wasn't unusual to see a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths. For the Gospel of Matthew tells us that there were many babies born in Bethlehem at night. But it would have been strange to have seen a baby lying in a manger or a feeding trough. For if the angel had not told them to look for such a specific sight, I'm sure they would never have believed it. They would never have seen it. They probably would have missed it completely. So this sign was really for identification purposes. And what were they to find there? Well, they found Mary and they found Joseph and the baby lying in the manger. And it must have been such a strange sight to come across because it was very specific from the angel. I doubt any other child born that night would have been born in a manger. And when they saw it, they made known the saying that had been told them concerning the child. And all who heard it wondered at what the shepherds told them. So it is interesting that even though these men were on the bottom of the social scale in Israel, God chose these men to be the first preachers of the newborn king. Slowly, this unique story must have spread across the city like wildfire. Because firstly, we notice that there was the vision by Zacharias and the story of Mary. And this was followed by the two strange births. And now we see the wonderful experience by the shepherds. And the Gospel of Matthew notes that upon uh, this arrival, there was also the arrival of the Magi, for their curiosity was to be of Jesus Christ. Now Luke tells us that all who wondered at what the shepherds told them, for they were amazed. And it, it is this amazing thread that runs through the Gospel of Luke, where we witness the shepherds returning after seeing baby Jesus. They were glorifying and they were praising God of all that they seen and all that they heard. They were experiencing much joy in their hearts, for they responded to the gospel with great joy. So maybe you are here today and you are listening, but you haven't responded to the gospel at all. You haven't responded to the gospel of grace yet. Perhaps you are living your life as if there are no consequences to your sin. But the scriptures make it clear, because if we don't participate in Christ's humiliation, we will never share in his exaltation. You will never experience the joy and the peace that comes from repenting and choosing to believe in the risen Christ. Now, you may experience much happiness in your life, but I don't believe you'll experience true joy that comes with knowing Christ personally, knowing him as your Lord and your Savior. For if you, take, if you choose to take this path, the scriptures again make it clear that on the day of judgment, 
when your sins are displayed before a holy God, that you will pay the penalty for them. For the Apostle Paul makes it clear, for the wages of sin is death. So instead, why not accept this free gift of grace offered by our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ? Repent and believe in the good news. It is never too late to repent. For Pastor told us last week, for today could be the day of your salvation. For you can go from being a full-time sinner to being a child of God with a transformed heart. But if you are a believer and perhaps you're not feeling the joy of Christmas at the moment, right? Perhaps you're going through a crisis where you are living in a valley of depression and feeling that you are immune from joy. Maybe, like us, you've experienced much loss during 2023. But maybe you might also be feeling afraid as well and you're feeling fearful. Just remember that the fear can choke you, right? It can limit you. It can stunt your spiritual growth. It wants to hide your God-given talents in the ground. Fear desires to pull you away from God. And that's exactly what the devil wants, right? Let the truth of God's word strengthen your passion for Christ and his gospel. For God desires you and I to experience much joy as we trust in him. And we know that joy, unlike the happiness, as we learn from our study in the Philippines, is not based on our circumstances, right? It is based on Christ living inside of us. For as long as Christ dwells within us, joy will never leave us. So it doesn't matter what circumstances we find ourselves, we can experience joy. For if we go through bad days, we can still have joy. If we go through good days, we can still have joy. And if nothing goes your way, you can still have joy. If everything goes your way, you can still experience much joy. For God wants you to impact the world, and He wants you to transform it. And we want that through your example of joy and obedience, others will be directed towards Christ. So in conclusion, as we look at the, these wonderful world, words by the song, Angels We Have Heard on High, we can see, we get this wonderful picture of the shepherds singing and praising God for the good news, for the birth of Jesus, the Savior of the world. And if we examine the history of the Christmas carol, we'll find that it originated in France and was originally titled Les Angers Dans Nos Campanas. Forgive the, <laughs> the accent. But the French legend actually indicates that in medieval, medieval times during the Christmas Eve, the shepherds would sing to one another from one hillside to another, that they would sing Gloria in excelsis Deo. It was how they would spread the holiday message of cheer, which points far away to one another. And from the hillside to the valley, the shepherd's song must have truly sounded like the angels that were calling to one another to celebrate the birth of Christ. Also, the song reflects the shepherd's joy of the time of the holiday season has yet arrived again. And in AD one, and, and in 129 AD, the Pope Telesphorus ordained that the Gloria be sung and the Christmas Eve Midnight Mass. The phrase became known as the Angel's Hymn and considered one of the earliest Christmas hymns. So, Angels We Have Heard on High reminds us of this amazing night. In the beautiful chorus, the carol helps us to experience of uh, to experience a taste of what the angels chorus might have sounded like as they proclaimed the good news christ's birth was certainly good news to those shepherds the savior changed their lives forever and god still likes to speak to ordinary people and transform their lives into something extraordinary through his grace and as we sing of the angel's great announcement, let's just remember that God still wants to announce the good news today. 
using people like you and me. We want to help perhaps a family member or a friend who might be in need. We can share the gospel story to a colleague or a friend at work. Or maybe we can just encourage a friend who's going through a very difficult time. But there are countless ways in which we can share the gospel of Jesus, where we can share Jesus' birth, much like the shepherds, so we could be the shepherds of our own day. Through, through your words and your actions, we can show that Jesus still lives in the hearts of men. So this Christmas season uh, and all through this coming year of 2024, let's continue the angel song. Let's tell the world about Jesus and how he has transformed our lives. So in a minute, we're going to have the um, worship team and the um, uh, choir come up and sing our song, Angels We Have Heard On High. But while they're doing that and preparing, why don't we pray? Heavenly Father, we just want to praise you. We want to honor you. We want to thank you for who you are. For Father, we, we know that you ordained it, that you sent your one and only Son, Jesus Christ, to come down from heaven, Lord, to be incarnate of the Virgin Mary, for he was made man, Lord. And we know that without this special gift, Lord, that our sins would never be forgiven, Lord. So, Lord, we just want to praise you and honor you. And as we sing this song today, Lord, we pray that it may fill our hearts with joy, Lord, so that we can go out into the world today and for the rest of this year and for 2024 to be singing of this wonderful praise, Lord. And, Father, we lift this all and we thank you for your Son, Jesus. We ask this in your Son's precious name, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.